It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello, and welcome <laughs> to episode 313 of Science on Top, live at the Kathleen Syme Library and Community Centre. Today is Wednesday, the 10th of October, 2018. I'm Ed Brown, and I'm joined by astronomer, uh, Director of Technology and Citizen Science at the Astronomical Society of the Pacific, co-host of the Astronomy Cast podcast, Dr. Pamela Gay. Hello. And Penny Dumsday. Hi. And Lucas Randall. Hello. And let's begin in the water, Penny. Why is science making some octopuses feel ecstatic? Yeah, I have to admit every week I always pick the stories I want to talk about based on the bizarreness of the head, the headline, and this was no exception. So octopuses get strangely cuddly on mood drug ecstasy. Now, I've never had ecstasy myself, but apparently oh, if you yeah. take it, um, if you take it, apparently you feel these extra loving feelings. And um, octopuses are really intelligent animals, but they're also very antisocial. I don't know if that goes along, except if they're mating. And they are like us, but also really, really different from us. There's 500 million years of evolution in between us and octopuses. Their brains are different. They have an entirely different structure. But some of the proteins and some of the chemical transmitters in their brains are the same as ours. So... One of the questions you want you could ask is do you know how do these drugs affect such complex animals that are so different from us? So the way that the experiment was done was apparently a very uh, humane way to give an octopus a drug. For example, if you want to um, to give it um, anesthesia, is you can just pop it in a beaker of ethanol. So these octopuses were popped in a beaker with ecstasy in it. The first concentration that they studied was too high, are the octopuses freaked out or started changing colour, um, exhibiting really defensive post, um, postures. So they lowered the dosage to be able to essentially drug the octopus. Um, Sorry, can, can I interrupt you yeah. for a second? They started changing colour. Because, <laughs> <laughs> so, is, I know psychedelics cause, you know, some, maybe they're trying to just keep their colour stable. Like the, the, the rest of the world is changing yeah. colours, I'm trying to match it. <laughs> so what the octopuses had was um, a situation where they, could, they were put into a tank and then they could either go to one side of the tank and play with like a little unfamiliar toy, and octopuses are quite smart, they like to do that, or the other side where there was an unfamiliar octopus. So if they'd been dunked in a saline solution, um, they tended to be really tentative towards the other octopus and prefer the toy. But if they'd been dunked in ecstasy, these really antisocial creatures would go towards the unfamiliar octopus and so, ex exhibit a behaviour that humans would interpret as hugging and cuddling and being really, really friendly. You know what it was? The octopus was going the other octopus and saying, dude, that toy's looking at me straight. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was really cool. What ecstasy apparently does is affects the way that serotonin is processed in our brains. And even though octopuses are quite different from us, some of the, the bit of the receptor that binds to ecstasy is the same. It's been also shown that um, giving serotonin to lobsters can alter their social behaviour. So, <laughs> like, <laughs> and make them a bit more aggressive. So, it seems like ecstasy, which does affect that system of brains, is altering octopus behaviour in a way that we interpret as being more affectionate and we see parallels in the way that interprets, um, it affects human behaviour, which I thought was really cool considering how different from us octopuses are. Um, but of course we can't really know if it's actual affection or what they're feeling. Um, but even just that the behavioural effect is similar, I thought was 
really, really interesting. Yeah. I just, I also want to mention the studies being criticised because the um, the octopuses were always given the saline solution first, and then the ecstasy. So it could have been. I mean, is do we know that they weren't just getting used to their tank, or the second time they met the other octopus, it was different? But it still seemed to me. I thought that was um, just a really interesting parallel between yeah. you know us and you know and another intelligent life yeah. form. Do yeah. you know whether was it clear whether they they the octopuses went through this many times? Like, was there a possibility they were getting used to other, or they were getting, um, you know, some kind of cues off the researchers? Who, you know, do they have yeah. a, do they experience placebo type effects? I don't know, but I've heard of octopuses doing pretty amazing things. Yeah. So. Yeah. I'm, that's. Uh, I'd like to know more about that study mm. to know what the design was, because that yeah. is certainly something you'd want to make sure that you're you're controlling for that sort of thing. Mm. What do you know? What the, what type of octopus they were? Um, two spotted two octopus, spotted, two yeah. Californian two spotted sort of octopus. Californian two spotted octopus. <laughs> um, so, has anyone in the audience been dipped into a beaker of it? <laughs> was that your experience? With, with, no. <laughs> I, I did once read that ecstasy was originally designed to treat couples having marriage problems. Well, I guess that's a win. That <laughs> chalked that up. But it would, I guess, it would make them. No, no, I won't say that. That's a, no. Wow. <laughs> um, I find the interesting thing is, as you're saying, the brains are different. So we're all familiar with the, the cauliflower sort of shape of a human brain. Octopus brains are donut shaped for some reason. They're also, it's a distributed nervous system. Yeah. So each tentacle kind of does a little bit of its own thinking for <laughs> itself. So I just find it fascinating that Despite that 500 years since a common ancestor, oh. there's still that similarity in terms of serotonin response. It's pretty cool. Oh, very cool. And that's the only non-astronomy stuff we've got <laughs> for you tonight. <laughs> there is good news for Star Trek lovers, Penny. Vulcan, the home world of pointy-eared Dr. Spock, has been discovered. And it's right where Gene Roddenberry predicted it would be. Isn't it? It is. I feel a bit silly talking about this. <laughs> but, no, no, but I mean, I've always loved hearing the new planet stories, yeah, but I feel now that for one to sort of get through to the popular media, it has to have a bit of a hook. So there was, a, you know, the diamond planet and now Vulcan, which I had never realised that Vulcan was associated with a particular star. Two different ones. At different oh, two times. different stars. Yes. Different times. Oh, there you go. This is the second time we found Vulcan, but this is the more <laughs> accurate time we found Vulcan. <laughs> But I was also thinking, wasn't Vulcan just destroyed? I'm sure I remember well, seeing that, that in a movie somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Alternate yeah. reality. Yeah. With awesome lens flares involved, no doubt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so um, a planet has been discovered um, around a star called 40 Eridani A. Um, it's unlikely, unfortunately, to host a civilization of intelligent, logical beings. Um, it's... So just like a... No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it seems to be a bit too close to its star to be in a habitable zone, so we probably won't find any Vulcans there. But um, it's what I really thought, uh, I mean, again, I wanted to talk about this because it was a Star Trek link. Yeah. This year is only 42 days yeah. long, which is a huge like, yeah. yeah, It's so quick. Um, is it time locked to the star? No. No? no. So what's cool to me about yeah. this is originally fandom had decided that Ada Eridani had Vulcan around it. But then later uh, in, I want to say it was a Voyager episode, but I could have this wrong. I, I could have this one wrong. Um, Gene Roddenberry and some of the other folks wrote in and said, no, 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 no the light travel time is this number of years is actually 40 Eridani. And so we have it from, from Gene Roddenberry that it's 40 Eridani. So we have now twice found, depending on which part of fandom you are in, <laughs> Vulcan. 
And as you say, it's quite close to its sun, and it is, with typical Vulcan hubris, a super Earth. It's about two or three times, I think, the size of Earth, uh, which does mean if there were a civilization on it, they would, they would be, be strong. stronger yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, than be. humans, just like Vulcans are, so therefore it's real. And twin suns. <laughs> twin suns, binary star system. Yeah. Okay. Japanese space agency JAXA um, has had a spacecraft orbiting the asteroid Ryugu since the end of June this year. It's now deployed, is it, it's three landers so far? It's, it, I double checked, it's actually two landers so far. Oh, it hadn't done the third one yet. No, it hasn't oh, done the third okay. one yet. Um, so I just checked, and you can actually go to hiya2now.jp uh, and find out exactly what the mission is going on, is going about. They have now translated their site into English, and because uh, Canberra is one of the places where they're monitoring it, you can actually find out, uh, is their data coming down to Australia at any given moment? Uh, it has these two cute little landers, uh, then it has the orbiting spacecraft, it will have two more landers to come, and we'll be bringing a rock home later. Now, you say landers, they're hoppers, they're bouncers, really. Well, they, they landed, but only for a brief moment. So these, these little landers, uh, they, they, they're disks, essentially. And, and these disks, as they go around, um, they have a spring, and the spring springs, and they get sprung into the air, where they hover for roughly 15 minutes, traveling 10 to 20 meters in any given direction. They have solar power, they're carrying wide-angle cameras, stereo cameras, and they can measure the temperature as they flit and fly about. And these are working completely autonomously. No one gets to get involved. They're sending their data back to Hayabusa 2, which is sending it back to Earth. And it's just clever. They're essentially wind-up toys of the most sophisticated kinds. So it's like a little pogo stick. Um, more like you That's pull the with a little canister yeah. from which they oh, deploy. I, so, They're like little discs. And, yeah. And they flip. They, they flip themselves into the air and spin. And that's how they move around. That's awesome. Yeah. The, the, the best way I know to think of them is if you've ever had any of these toys that has a, a springy bit that you pull back, and when you let go, it whips around the disc. Well, that's what these do. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, they're adorable. It might have been Robot Wars as well. Like some, some, of the, some of the robots. <laughs> the other ones, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there, there's two more rovers to go. Uh, these are rover 1A and 1B. They are twin missions. Uh, we have rover 2, which will be coming, that adds an accelerometer. And optical and ultraviolet LEDs will light its path. And then finally, we have the mascot mission. Um, so... Oh, I lied. That it is three landers. I lied. It is three landers. They successfully got Mascot down. So Mascot um, operated by battery for 17 hours. Okay. I thought it only had a 16-hour battery life, so they make things to last. That's good. It's it true. exceeded its expectations. Well, well uh, opportunity and spirit were spent. Yeah. supposed to be on a 90-day mission. So three lives, hours. we build things to last. <laughs> Very true. So, can you tell us about Ryugu then? This is a near Earth object, so it yes. crosses Earth's orbit with the sun every now and then, I think. Is that right? It, it's true. So, this is a near Earth asteroid. It is so tiny, just a couple of kilometers across, that it it's not round. It, in fact, kind of looks like a dice that got run over by a car a few too many times. And it has a nice crater that you can imagine loosely used to be the number one on the dice that got run over by a car too many times. Um, but it has a rocky, um, dirt-covered surface. And one of the things that we're now learning is these itty-bitty little tiny crater, not craters, asteroids that we keep 
sending spacecraft to, we've sent them to Itakawa in the past, tend to have this boulder strewn surface. And this raises the question of where do all the boulders come from? Because it's not like they have erosion like we do. And so there is a lot of interesting materials research going on here on Earth, trying to figure out, well, if you have enough temperature fluctuations, can you get the boulders to break loose? Just where do they come from? So we have a boulder strewn object somewhere that, well, up until Itakawa, we weren't really expecting boulders like this. And the other, I guess, important thing is, like all asteroids, space rocks, <laughs> as we uh, call them, so we don't confuse them with meteors and comets and all that. Space rocks, these are the leftovers of the formation of the solar system, is that right? Yes, so an object like this, that's small, that's undifferentiated, that hasn't had cryovolcanism or any of those cool geophysics things mucking about with its mineralogy, this particular kind of an object, if you go and gather up its rocks, tear them apart in a mass spectrometer, you can get samples of the leftover bits of the formation of our solar system. You can measure the age of the rock by counting atoms and seeing here are the various daughter particles of radioactive materials that have decayed. And by counting all of these atoms, you can figure out just how old this object is. You can look at the volatiles, the gases trapped in the inclusions in the rock and figure out, well, what exactly was at different distances from the sun when you look at these different asteroids. They're essentially these little space holders of early material from different points in our solar system's formation. Very cool. Lucas, you said before that the Hubble Space Telescope, in terms of discoveries, is probably one of the most significant single instruments in science. I'm correct. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but after a gyroscope failed a few days ago, its days, which were already numbered, they might be more numbered. <laughs> what number are the numbers? Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, so um, H Hubble, as... as we all know he's awesome. Um, uh, I think there's no, there's no valid argument <laughs> against that. But Hubble has been up there quite some time. Um, we've been seeing amazing images and, and incredible science from this instrument for so many years. Um, but the problem is we no longer have an American space program that's capable we of reaching it. We have a space it. program. That's <laughs> capable of reaching it. Okay, fair. And so I didn't finish my sentence. That's capable of reaching it. Uh, with anything that can do any servicing on it. So the last servicing mission that occurred on Hubble was back in 2009. And during that servicing mission, which was, which was absolutely going to be the last one because then they were retiring the space shuttle program, um, they actually put in some new gyro wheels in it. Now, does anyone know, does anyone not, has anyone not seen gyroscopes being, being um, used to stabilize things? They're, they're really cool. There's, there are animations you can, you can look up online, and I, I found a few, but I, they're licensed by other people or whatever, so I, I, I can't show you them now. Um, but um, there are also some NASA, there's some NASA footage of experiments where they show uh, astronauts on the, the space station spinning gyroscopes in space. So they're in microgravity, and these gyroscopes are just hovering in front of them. And as they interact with these gyroscopes, they want to keep correcting, they want to keep going back to the plane they are on because of that conservation momentum. They're spinning around, and they want to always stay in the same location. So when you've got multiples of these that are pointing in different axes, you can use them to figure out which, which way you're, you've rotated, and you can use them to aim your instrument. So we've talked before on the show about the, um, the very awesome Kepler mission, which itself has had gyroscope or stabilisation wheels um, that have failed. And it had, uh, after its first failure of these, these gyros, they extended the mission by figuring out another way that they could, they could you know, utilise the, the instrument and, and, and aim it, not quite so precisely on a bigger swathe of sky, but it meant that they could extend the mission. Then another one failed and they had to figure out how we're we gonna do this. So there are things you can do. Incidentally, Kepler, I think it's, it's just about to run out of fuel. 
So that's kind of, that's the end. There's not much you can do once they're out of fuel. It's, it's, it's going to go, which is a shame, but it's been an incredible instrument. Actually, what's coming up to replace Kepler? What's the next mission? We, we don't really have those so much. We have TESS, which isn't a replacement. It's a different kind of right, mission. Right. So Kepler, the way Kepler's working, is it's looking at specific fields, which gives you a look through a column or a cone, more accurately, of space, where you're looking at a small volume nearby and a larger and larger volume as you look further and further away. Because even though your field of view say, stays the same size on the sky, how many light years across that is changes as you look further and further away. With Kepler, we're primarily finding planets around more distant stars. And that's just a function of we're looking at a larger volume of space further mm. away. So, of course, we're going to find more stuff in the bigger volume. With TESS, it's preferentially looking at a variety of stars that are in our local universe. And the goal is to be able to find planets that are near enough that we can rapidly do follow-up using, well, it was designed for JWST. JWST won't launch until maybe March 2021. Probably not considering it's scheduled for March 30th. We're going to go with April at the earliest. Maybe. <laughs> Emma is very, very skeptical about missions that haven't launched yet. They're generation. dead to me, you tell them. That. I, I, I had an X ray spacecraft that I needed for my dissertation decide to just not work after launch. So since then, I, I simply say spacecraft are dead to me until after they have launched and returned data. So TESS, which is starting to return data, um, it it is looking at fields nearby. And the idea was, and is now getting modified, that telescopes such as JWST, which has not yet launched, will do rapid follow-up observations, allowing us to spectroscopically study the stars and planets that TESS is uncovering. Luckily, we do have things like the Very Large Telescope down in Chile, that uh, with its multiple telescopes with eight meter mirrors, is amazing spectroscopes will be able to do some of that follow-up work. Um, so it's doing a slightly different mission, but it is, excuse me, I have the hiccups. It is our planet finding robot of tomorrow. Uh, we also have the Gaia mission, which is just looking at everything you can look at when you have the best positional data anything can possibly have. Right. So Guy is also going to find a ton of planets, but it's going to find them um, in a less that's all it does kind of way. Right. If you want to know more about any of these these awesome missions that are happening now, have happened or will happen in the future, Pamela's covered most of them on Astronomy Cast in, in a lot of detail. So I uh, highly recommend that you listen in. So in the case of Hubble, though, um, we've got this situation where on the weekend, as it turned out, um, another one of the gyros failed. Now, in 2009, they put in six new gyroscopes, and since then, three of those new gyroscopes have failed until the weekend, and then a fourth one failed. Now, in order for the scope to do what it's designed to do at maximum efficiency, it needs three gyroscopes in order to do it. So, um, on the weekends, as I said, a, a fourth one failed but they were still using an old gyroscope from uh, an earlier mission, 2004, I think, 2005 or something like that. Um, they had an earlier uh, gyroscope that was still running it. That gyro has actually been exhibiting signs of it's going to fail for almost a year. So they knew it was coming up. So it wasn't a huge surprise in that it went. But when it did go, they went, cool, flick on the other one. And apparently the new one started to send garbled messages back to NASA saying, oh, I, I'm not, it's not exactly how it sounds, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. It um, was <laughs> And uh, so yeah, it meant that um, they couldn't activate the new gyro. So the, the scope actually drops into sort of like a safe mode, so it doesn't go full blue screen of death on us, it's just sort of safe mode, it's like I'll wait for command, you figure out what's going on. So NASA don't seem to be too concerned about this they're saying the remaining three gyros available for use are technically enhanced and therefore expected to have significantly longer operational lives. They believe they'll be able to get them up and running again, but they need to figure out what's, what's wrong, basically, at the moment. So it might, may well not be the gyros themselves, it might be a control thing, it's, there's all sorts of uh, 
uh, possibilities there. So Nestle seemed to be at least indicating that, hey, this is not a huge big deal, we'll, we'll get it operational, but just right now it's not. Right. I, when I read this though, was thinking about those poor, poor astronomers who've booked time. I've for, been that astronomer. <laughs> Because as we've covered on the show before, it's not like they go, Pamela, we'll give you next week instead. Yeah. That's it. That could be it for you, for your project or well, your PhD or whatever. So they are pretty good about delaying things, but you don't know how long you'll have to wait. Right. Uh, I was part of a project that had time to use Hubble right after the servicing mission that kept getting delayed. <laughs> And, and the issue is this, this isn't just a delay in science, this is also a delay in funding. If you have time on the Hubble Space Telescope, they give you grant money that will enable you to have what you need right. to get the best science possible out of the data you get. Hubble stops working, the money goes away, your graduate student is now not even able to afford ramen. and. And this affects people's ability to get promotion and tenure. So much is wrapped around the safety as one of these spacecraft. So it is not inconceivable that there is an early career researcher out there who's like, cool, I got time on Hubble. <laughs> and their ability to get promoted into a permanent position is based on their ability to get a grant. And their grant, which they got, goes away if Hubble goes away. So there's a lot of ancillary damage that occurs when we lose these missions. The science is, of course, not just one for that one scientist. Of that. Uh, it is our hope that Hubble has the potential to keep lasting long enough to overlap with JWST whenever it may launch. It is our hope that Congress will allow us to fund both spacecraft at the same time. We've previously been told that won't be the case. It varies with Congress to Congress. Um, but we've managed to operate Hubble with a single gyroscope in the past. It's down to two. We think we can do the software equivalent of getting out and kicking and getting that third one working. It's early to tell. Now, folks who work at NASA are trained not to be excitable and panic. They're excitable when everything goes right. Oh my gosh, cameras are on them, all the joy is seen. <laughs> but in that moment of, oh, huh, you have procedures, you have manuals, you have safe mode, you have the backup systems that you have on Earth to test your ideas on. And they're working their way through all of that stuff. And this is thankfully software I am not responsible for. <laughs> and um, hopefully we will have clear communications of what is going on. So when it comes to James Webb, mm -hmm. and I know it's dead too, it's not in, in space. Um, we were talking today how James Webb also is quite possibly the first real black hole on Earth because of the effect it's had on the funding for other projects. It just sucks it all in, sucks in all the money. Have you been affected by this in any projects that you are allowed to talk about? Because <laughs> I saw her eyes as I started asking this question. <laughs> So, we so, can edit this. <laughs> so, so there is, I, I think I'm allowed to say this. This is me speaking as me using information I have heard outside of my NASA funded job. Let's say you saw a tweet. You saw a tweet. I, I haven't seen a tweet, but oh. I've heard this from human beings outside okay. of my chain of command. Yeah. So, so, reality anyone can come out with. James Webb Space Telescope didn't launch. It's still undergoing ongoing construction costs. A spacecraft is never more expensive than when it's on the ground. When they shook it, things shook off. They now have to go through, figure out what happened, make sure nothing was damaged, fix anything that was damaged, package it all up, get it back to where it is, double check that they still have a rocket they can use. That's the one I need to check up on because I haven't recently. Um, and Congress capped it at $6 billion, flat. 
Thou shalt not go over. NASA has said we're going to go over. We're still waiting to see what Congress says about that. NASA has a flat budget. Costs of things day to day go up. Our economy in the United States is finally starting to improve thanks to measures that have been put in place over the past six years that rescued us from the Great Recession. As our economy improves, interest rates are going up, costs are going up, we're trying to avoid inflation, it's going to happen. So that means that a flat budget is a decreasing budget. You can't not pay for the lights, you can't not pay for the buildings, you can't not pay for the communications with the existing spacecraft. You can't not pay to finish the spacecraft like JWST that are so expletive close to being done. There are other spacecraft in jeopardy, W-1st being the primary one. I did have fundings related to W-1st canceled. Um, What I have been warned of through the non-official channels is that cost overruns with JWST are going to force NASA's hand to find other programs that are not mission critical to the long-term goals of the agency. And the work I do is not mission critical to the long-term goals of the agency, and I have to acknowledge that. I'm one of the people who, except for what I'm doing with Bennu, which is paid for by the mission, everything else I do is going through and cleaning up loose data and looking for science that was hiding under a crater. That's not mission critical. This means that when it comes time to start canceling programs, I don't think I'm the first one to go, but the program that I'm within, the suite of projects that I'm within, is one that Trump has already called to have canceled. And I live with that every day. So there is a real chance that I have to tell every person, every student that I hire. We already have been told we shouldn't be funded. We are funded by the grace of Congress. And I don't know how long it will last. So I am lucky to do science for every day they let me do science. So we're passing the hat around after the show. <laughs> <laughs> no, we do like to finish the show on a positive note. Um, but um, serious concerns. And, um, yeah. Yeah. I've decided I get a puppy if, we, if I lose my grant. I think you should get a puppy either way. <laughs> <laughs> that is our show. God, that was quick. <laughs> we got this room until 12.30 anyway. No, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Thank you for being on the show, Pamela. It has been fantastic. Thank you so much. I, I always love getting to come down here and... Over the years, you guys have become true friends, and thank you so much for having me. Oh, that's awesome having you. Can we maybe have a few questions before we wrap it up? That should be in the show. That would be cool. Yes. Um, assumably, Hubble when it launched had mounting points that held it in the shuttle. Yes. Could those mounting points be attached to by another vehicle? Oh, yeah. Full of gyros that would then point... Hubble by holding it and pointing it at the star. I love that idea. We don't have the budget for it. No, obviously. Yeah, so no. all of these things, so it wasn't so much that that was thought of previously, but one of the concerns is Hubble's big enough and bulky enough and dense enough that if you drop it on the Earth, parts are going to hit. We've already hit you guys with Skylab. We don't want to do it again. Um, so one, one of the things that's been thought hard about is How do you deorbit Hubble? Mm -hmm. And at a certain point, we're going to have to do that strategically, or we're going to have to mount something to it and boost it to a higher orbit. So since we know we can boost it to a higher orbit, yes, we can mount stuff onto it. I don't think that mounting gyroscopes onto it would be feasible because it would change the center of mass in curious ways that the rest of the system may not be able to deal with very well. But at the end of the day, we don't have a sufficient number of rockets, and we certainly don't have a sufficient number of dollars. When Hubble's over, Hubble's over, and we've known that since the mid-2000s. 
We got it longer than we thought. 2009 was a miracle thanks to so many people writing to their Congress critters and asking to please save Hubble. And it worked. So always remember, in our democracies, we do occasionally have a more powerful voice than we might think. Yes. Other Russians are haters. No, but the Chinese are catching up quickly. Um, seriously, China is the place to be. Yeah. They, they have their own space station. They've been forced to develop everything solo because uh, there are regulations preventing U.S. and Chinese scientists from working together in many different circumstances, and the Chinese aren't allowed on the International Space Station. Um, due to these restrictions, they're just moving along, doing things at their own pace, and getting it done. They're on space station number two. They're working on planning their first manned missions to the moon. They are planning on moon mining. They have a bright future ahead of them. Now, we do have our commercial space agencies that have their own goals as well as their commercial goals. And so the real interesting part is going to be um, what do the commercial space agencies start to accomplish when international space flight is no longer just in the purview of governmental space agencies. Any other questions? <laughs> cool. Thank you very much, everybody. All the, show, all the links will be on the show notes and on the web at scienceontop.com slash 313. Thank you very much, Pamela, Penny, Lucas, and everyone for turning up. Thank you for everyone for listening. We'll be back again next week putting science on top of the agenda. He actually says that every week. <laughs> yes. like, it's not a recording. He literally says that. Now the fun begins. The vehicle is moving at nearly 13,000 miles an hour, but it's hitting the top of the atmosphere at a very shallow angle, 12 degrees. Any steeper, the vehicle will hit the thicker part of the atmosphere and will melt and burn up. Any shallower, the vehicle will bounce off the atmosphere of Mars. At the very top of the atmosphere, it's about 70 miles above the surface of Mars, and the air is starting to get thicker and thicker and thicker. As it does that, the temperature on the heat shield gets well over 1,000 degrees centigrade, enough to melt steel. Over the next two minutes, the vehicle decelerates at a backbreaking 12 Earth Gs, from 13,000 miles an hour to about 1,000 miles an hour. At about 10 miles above the surface of Mars, a supersonic parachute is launched out of the back of the vehicle. 15 seconds after the parachute inflates, it's time to get rid of the heat shield. Six pyrotechnic devices fire simultaneously, allowing the heat shield to fall and tumble away from the vehicle, exposing the lander to the surface of Mars. 10 seconds after the heat shield is dropped, three pyrotechnically deployed legs are released and locked for landing. About a minute later, the landing radar is turned on, sending pulses toward the surface of Mars as the vehicle starts to try to measure how high it is above the surface and how fast it's going. At about a mile above the surface of Mars, the lander falls away from the back shell and lights its engines. And very quickly, the vehicle must rotate out of the way so that the parachute and the back shell doesn't come down to hit it. The last thing that has to happen is that on the moment of contact, the engines have to shut down immediately. If they don't, the vehicle will tip over. So if all the steps of entry, descent, and landing happen perfectly and we are safely on the surface of Mars, we'll be ready to do some exciting new science.